Dean, and welcome everybody. Uh, I assume you can hear me. Uh, today we're going to talk about working with Oracle Clinical and RDC, specifically the flexible study design feature that was added into Oracle RDC as part of release 4.6. A uh, little welcome introduction. My name is Steve Rifkin, as you know, of course. Uh, I have about 15 plus years, almost 16 years of experience working with Oracle Clinical, TMS, and RDC. Uh, originally, I was working with Oracle as an Oracle Clinical Consultant when the product first started in approximately 1995, and I have worked with Biofarm uh, for the last, uh, I guess, almost 11 years now. I've done database design, study setup, custom study conduct, custom coding, whatever needed to be done with the Oracle Clinical suite of products I've been involved with over the last 15 plus years. Today's agenda is roughly going to be followed over here anyway. We already had the welcome and introduction. We're now going to go through some who, what, and why, who should be here, what you want to see, what you will learn, and why you want to learn it. Then we'll go through a discussion of flexible study design and also doing demonstrations as we're discussing what flexible study design actually is. Then we're going to back up a little and go through the setup steps that you would need to get to what we were demonstrating. Finally, we have some time for question and answers, and there'll be a wrap-up and contact information. Hopefully, we will finish up uh, 11 o'clock without, without difficulty. Okay, the who, the what, and the why. Well, who is the intended audience for this, for this seminar, for this webinar? Basically, it would be the current Oracle Clinical RDC users, who are contemplating an upgrade to version 4.6. Uh, 4.6 has been out now for about maybe a year and a half, maybe two years, uh, and it's the current version. Actually, 4.6.2 is the current version, but the new features in 4 were all put into 4.6 for the most part. Also, we want to talk about new users of Oracle Clinical RGC 4.6 who want to learn more about flexible study design. These are users who have just installed Oracle Clinical RGC and are still undergoing a little bit of a learning process. As we all know, uh, the learning curve for OC is, is quite, quite steep. We also want to talk about uh, who should be seeing this class are the non-Oracle clinical RDC users. These people may be evaluating the features of the application, trying to decide whether they should use, that, use this application or another Oracle product, such as the Inform or uh, even possibly a competitor. I hope not, but possibly a competitor. What, what fees are we going to examine today? Well, we're going to basically demonstrate flexible study design. And I'm going to show the ability to uh, enable the expectedness or disable the expectedness of complete forms or maybe sets of visits based on response to data in, that's been entered into the RDC system. We'll also talk about how to set up a flexible study via the enhanced DCI book. And finally, uh, we'll talk about the why. why why these features are important to you, because many organizations need the ability to create a study schedule which is very, very flexible. Uh, in complex trials, you really don't know exactly what the pathway of CRS and process and procedures are going to be until you start acquiring some data. In the non-flexible study, you are basically expected, you listed out what you expected every patient to undergo and could modify that through validation procedures to some extent to change the DCI book assigned. But for the most part, it was not dynamic. In, uh, or in uh, flexible study design, it's dynamic scheduling. And it's especially important uh, where the sites will form the entry in an EDC system such as RDC. Because then the user is going to be uh, presented only with the form and visits that, that they need to respond to. Uh, the fees I'm going to talk about are actually only going to be available in the EDC interface, in the RDC interface. With an Oracle Clinical itself, that's the way you do all the setup for the flexible study design, but you only see the results of flexible study design when you're in the EDC interface. Well, what is flexible study design? Again, prior to release 4.6, Oracle Clinical required a very strict navigation through a set of defined pages and visits and the an event that were listed in something called the DCI book. Some trials <coughs> require a complex or flexible studies, may have different treatment arms, maybe have multiple treatment arms, maybe different patient groups. Maybe the treatment arm itself might be uh, determined upon the uh, ch might be a dependent upon a change when the data entered for the patient in the screening visit or, or subsequent treatment visits 
are different, they're assessed. So you make an assessment, you decide what to do. Should you continue the study or go to another treatment arm, go to another, uh, another regimen perhaps, uh, terminate from the study. These are all things that are very complex definitions. They're usually made uh, previously by the investigator saying we can't go on. Here we can have more, more automatic and more dynamic assignment based on the study rules. And again, it's going to be quite common for oncology trials, much more than uh, simple trials. Flexible study design in version 4.6, release 4.6, allows multiple pathways to be defined in a single DCI book. But when you define that book, you're going to be defining rules, which basically provide conditional logic based on the data entered for a specific patient. That logic will either enable or disable either sets of visits or perhaps even specific CRFs within a visit for that patient. So different CRFs become expected based on the data that has been entered for the, for the uh, patient. Also, the RDC interface is now going to have a dynamic display. So when data is entered for a visit or for a form in a visit, and that data determines the expectedness of other visits or other forms, there's dynamic update of the RDC display as that CRF data is saved within the system, as it's entered and saved. And we're going to be demonstrating all these things right now. And before I start the demonstration, I want to talk a little about the study which I've set up in our training database uh, and how it looks. It's a pretty simple, complex study, I guess is the best way of saying it. It has a screening visit, and depending upon the screening visit, uh, a person will be assigned either to arm A, or arm B. Arm A is defined to be three cycles, and each cycle has three visits for treatment and a fourth rest or interim visit. Uh, treatment B has only two cycles planned, but there are going to be four treatment visits and one interim visit. Both arms have a completion visit, a completion form, and also log visits. AEs and con meds, for example, might be collected in the log visit. Well, given that, what are the rules that we want for this example study to follow? Until that is entered for demography form, we only want to have the screening visit expected. If the person doesn't pass screening, we don't want any other information being requested or being expected. Once the demography data is entered, though, uh, we do want to enable a completion and log visits. We want to basically enable two other visits in addition to the screening visit. The enrollment CRF during the screening visit is going to determine whether or not the person is scheduled in A, cycle A rather, or arm A rather, arm B, and that will uh, schedule the first cycle for either arm A or arm B depending what cycle they're put in. If they're not put in any cycle, they're not enrolled in the study in the enrollment form, they basically will have just a study completion form as long as it's going to be needed. The third rule that we have is that when you respond to a question during the interim visit, which is the rest visit in a cycle, it's going to say, do you want to continue with the next cycle? If the answer is yes, if you're in cycle A, it will schedule cycle B. Uh, cycle 1 will schedule cycle 2, et cetera. 2 will schedule 3. If you say no, it's going to basically make those other cycles unexpected or not required, not expected, and you will move to the completion and termination logs as the only other visits. If during a treatment visit uh, you're not given the treatment, perhaps your blood counts are too low, you're going to basically terminate any other, no, no longer expect any other visits within that treatment cycle, and basically have the subject complete the study completion and the log forms at all. And finally, if treatment is given, you're going to have a new CRF enabled for that visit, which will basically record some information about the, the drug dosing, et cetera. So these are the five rules that we're going to follow with this example study. Now let's follow the first rule. Only the screening visit is expected until data is entered on demography form. When you enter demography, it's going to enable the completion and log forms. So screening, the only one that's going to be visible initially. When we enter some screening data action in the demography form, we're going to schedule the completion and logs visits. Let's see how that's going to be done. Let's see how that actually is affected. 
Here we have Oracle Clinical, RTC interface, and I'm going to take patient number one, and I'm going to press go. Uh, that's right, because I timed out. Sorry, I logged on too soon. So let me go to here again. Hopefully, it's there. Oh, God. Okay, I'm going to select visit one. Just open a patient case book for visit patient number zero. And we see right now we have nothing being entered for that patient data. There's no patient data at all. And right now only the screening visit is expected. Once we enter the demography data, any data, male, I'll just enter that data. I can enter the mic. No, I'll not do that. Save it. Save complete, and we've recalculated expecting this. There's a form here, but notice now the screening visit and the, and the study visit and AE log visits are now expected for this particular patient. If I did not enter any data, there'd be nothing there. Remember, until I entered the demography form, there was only screening visit, was the only visit that was going to be expected. So, rule two, we have the completion visit and the log visit scheduled. The enrollment CRF at the screening visit is going to specify whether the patient is going to be put into arm A or arm B. And at the same time, we'll schedule the treatments in arm A or arm B with the interim visit. So if arm A, if the patient is enrolled in arm A, we get arm A, cycle one. If it's arm B, we're going to get arm B, cycle one. See what that does. The enrollment form is in the screening visit. We'll leave the same patient and we'll enroll that for arm A. And we see we're going to enroll yes in arm A. And if we save, save complete. When we come back to this particular patient, we're going to have all the three treatments scheduled for patient for psych A, arm A, cycle one, treatment one, two, three, and the interim, as well as the end of study and log forms. If we go up to the enrollment form again and say, whoops, we made a mistake, it's not really arm A, it's going to be arm B, yeah. change the data and save that. Now we're going to see that arm B is expected the four treatments in arm B with the interim treatment. These are the expected visits. Dynamically changed what was expected. Now, rule three. There's going to be, in each interim visit, there's going to be a question that says, do you want to continue to the next cycle? And if you say yes, it's going to schedule the next treatment cycle. If you say no, we're going to continue the next cycle, but we're, going to, we're not going to continue the next cycle. We're going to bypass all the remaining cycles and go right to the completion form. So let's try that. We have enrollment A. Let's go to the interim treatment for the B cycle. And we'll see interim is where that's going to be requested. And we'll say continue the next cycle, yes. And we'll save that. Well, it's got the visit date. And if we save that, we notice that now we have all the cycle two treatments. Again, this is the B. It will be the same thing for the A. And if we go back and change that to no, and save. Whoops. Notice the cycle two treatment is no longer there. It expects to go right to the end of study log. 
nothing else is expected. And that's exactly what we want to do with Rule 3. We did a demonstration. Now, Rule 4 says that if we give no to a give treatment in any treatment uh, visit, it's going to bypass the remaining visits in the cycle. You may decide in the middle of a treatment cycle that the blood count is too low, the response is too poor, it's too dangerous, you can't continue, so you want to stop. At a treatment visit, just say no, no more, and the thing stops. So we can do that again. We can go to, let's schedule visit two, cycle two. So we'll say yes. And we see cycle two is now scheduled. So cycle two is scheduled. And we're in the treatment one, first treatment visit of cycle two. Now I have a hemodose. And we see that should drug be given this visit? No. Give a visit date. Save it. Save complete. And when we close the form out, we now see that there are no more visits expected in the second cycle, in cycle two. Because the rule says once you don't give a dose of this particular study, you're out of the study. You're, you're, being, you're going to be dropped, terminated. That's the next rule. That's this rule four. Rule five says that if we do give the drug in a visit, we want to schedule another form called an infusion form. So if the drug is given during a visit, you don't terminate the uh, remaining treatment cycle, but you also will now schedule a new form to be completed called the infusion form. And we can use the same hemodose. We'll say, let's go up to hemodose, and let's say we want to give the treatment. When we do that, you notice there is a new form scheduled. The infusion form is scheduled. That was a little dash before. It was not expected to be entered until the uh, dose was, uh, the drug was said to be given at a particular visit. So that's the fifth thing that we get to the demonstration on. We've basically gone through the, how the interface looks, how it's dynamic going on as data is being entered for a patient. Now, that was all in RDC. Again, you cannot see any of that flexibility, any of that dynamic nature if you're using a non-flexible study in or, in either in Oracle Clinical or through RDC. You cannot see it unless you are using RDC. RDC has the, the dynamic display. If you're using a paper study, it doesn't work at all like this if you're using Oracle Clinical Data Entry. It will also not do any uh, work if you're using uh, classical mode entry in RDC. I'm not, although to be honest with you, I'm not sure that's supported with 4.6 anymore. Uh, I'd have to check back on that. But now that we've seen what this can do, let's talk about how we set up a flexible study. What setup work you have to do within Oracle Clinical through some new Oracle Clinical functions that are on the main menu to set up a flexible study. <clears throat> First thing we need to do is identify the studies flexible during the initial study setup. Basically, that's a setting in the clinical study state screen. <clears throat> you can set it up to uh, automatically Define each study is, is flexible, but there is a new prompt in, in Easy Study Design which says, "Do you want to make this study flexible or not?" And if you say yes, it will make the study flexible. Then we need to define the intervals and the clinical planned events for the study, and then we need to set up the enhanced DCI book with the DCI book rule. Again, creating a flexible study, as I said before, is just involves checking off this flex study enabled flag on the clinical study state screen for that specific study. <clears throat> Again, during easy study design, there'll be a new question which pops up, do you want to make this a flexible study? You say yes, it's flexible. Only restriction is that you cannot have page tracking and flex study enabled defined at the same time. It's one or the other. Flex study 
design is uh, inconsistent with CRF page tracking. That's not a big deal because most people don't use CRF page tracking anyway. Not what it sounds like. So most people don't use it. Uh, the other restriction is you cannot change the flex study enable flag either making it, you cannot enable it, I guess, if there's any uh, data which has been acquired in the system already. Any, you know, received DCM, received DCI has been entered. Let's talk about intervals. An interval has always existed within Oracle Clinical, but it was never really used for very much. It only made people confused and typically was not used. But an interval is basically a span of, a span of time in which there are going to be one or more visits or clinical plan events. Intervals, although, again, present within Oracle Clinical for quite a while, were never really used in any meaningful way. However, they are used very heavily within uh, RDC now, in version 4.6 for flux studies. So we need to understand what they are. There are three types of intervals. There are phases, there are intervals called phases, intervals called periods, and intervals called subperiods. Phase is not phase one, phase two, phase three of a clinical study, a type clinical study. It's <clears throat> simply it's a type of label for an interval. Period is a type of interval, a subperiod is a type of interval. We look at this picture over here on the right and we see we have phases on the top line, a phase could have one or more periods, which is the second line, and a period could have one or more subperiods, no, or no subperiods. Basically, an interval is the lowest level of this hierarchy. That's the interval, and that will contain one or more visits that will be maintained as part of that interval. When you model a study that's gonna be a flexible study design, you have to model the study and that involves placing the visits in specific intervals. Because these intervals are the groups of visits that are going to be enabled by the logic in the flex study design rules that we're going to talk about in a little while. So the study that we set up as a demo has phases, a screening phase, a treatment phase, a completion phase, and a log phase. And those are the periods we have two treatment phases, we have an arm A period and an arm B period, and we also have subperiods, A cycle one, cycle two, cycle three, B cycle one, B cycle two. So we have three levels, and the intervals are basically the things that are being highlighted, because these intervals are where we're going to place visits when we go on to define the uh, clinical plan events. Each interval has to have a unique name. Suggested to name them somewhat meaningful so you sort of know what they are when you're looking at them. You want to define the interval? They're going to be defined from the Easy Study Design screen when you press the intervals button. Every clinical plan event in your study must be defined and associated or part of an interval. And again, that interval could be a phase, it could be a period, or it could be a subperiod but every visit, every clinical planned event will be in an interval. Each clinical planned event has to have a unique name, that's nothing new. So you probably should choose meaningful names. The way I chose it was, for example, treatment one visit is divided in multiple intervals, so I have of treatment one visit in arm A for cycle one named arm A cycle one treatment one, arm A cycle two treatment two, treatment one rather, arm B cycle one treatment one. They're all the first or second, the first treatment visits, but they're in different intervals depending upon both the arm and the actual uh, uh, cycle number. Visit number fields need to reflect the sequence and the schedule, but really may not reflect the exact sequence of events for the patient. For example, if you have two arms, <clears throat> as we do here, you could have visits number three, four, five, and six in cycle A, uh, visit in, in cycle one rather, Next three visits could be in cycle uh, two, et cetera. But arm B might start off cycle fifth, might be visit number 15. So you have to take care about that as well. But again, they should be sequential. Duration fields are required, <clears throat> but again, they have no real effect on flexible study design. If you remember those forms, if you look to them for Oracle Clinical, they have min and max offset from beginning of phase, beginning of interval. So. They can be filled in, they are required, but most 
time they're not going to be used at all. The scheduling report doesn't really work anymore as it did before. Next thing we have to talk about is the enhanced DCI books. This has four sections. It has a navigator section, a constraint section, a rule section, uh, both interval rules and a DCI rule section. The enhanced DCI book is actually uh, brought up uh, for both flexible and not flexible studies. In non flexible studies, you will not be able to define interval rules and DCI rules. Although the DCI book, the regular old DCI book, still exists, the enhanced DCI book gives some benefits of things you can do. The navigation is a little more straightforward uh, in the enhanced book. So you could use that for non flexible studies as well. But DCI books, the plain old DCI books, can be used for non-flexible, but cannot be used for the flexible credit design. Uh, the constraint section is the same as it is for the uh, old DCI book. There's no increase in flexibility there at all. And we'll talk more about rules as we go on. So again, these two buttons will be in a disabled. That's going to be the same thing as we're going to be on the uh, uh, Oracle Clinical old DCI book. And Navigator is something new. And the Navigator is kind of nice. Basically, it's going to pre-populate all the clinical planning events and all the intervals those events are assigned to as soon as the book is opened. They're all pre-populated for the events listed in the study. Then you're going to need to define which exact CRFs are expected or could be expected for each of these visits. These is the visit number. Again, that's brought up from the clinical plan event screen. And these are updated visible uh, are a view only screen. They're updated continuously, dynamically, as you actually add a clinical plan event to a, a specific CRF to a CPE. So you select a visit, and then press book pages. And when you press the book pages, it will bring up a page which looks like this, where you basically list all the forms that might be expected at that visit. Okay. And then what's nice is you have these two buttons, previous CPE and next CPE. And then it will bring up the forms for the next clinical plan event. So this course is the first one for screening. <coughs> or previous, going back one. So the navigation is pretty straightforward. And I think it, you'll probably want to use it even for non-flexible studies. Now, book rules. This is the new stuff. Book rules are going to be available only for flexible studies, and they apply to all patients assigned that book. It's generally expected that you will create one book for the study, and all patients will be assigned to that book. And that book will contain rules which will define which visits will actually be expected and which forms will actually be expected. Interval rules basically enable or disable an entire interval. So it will <clears throat> enable a whole set of forms or disable a whole set of forms. Uh, or part of a form, part of a set, and depending when you when the trigger executes. DCI rules enable a specific DCI. The DCI could be within the current visit, so enable this for this visit, enable this infusion form for this particular visit, or it could be something that occurs in one visit and you want to enable in all future visits where that DCI has already been defined. Remember, the DCI book is going to list all the possible the superset of what you might expect to visit. So any page, any visit rather, where that new form is enabled, you can say, I want to enable this particular CRF over all the visits that have this DCI. And the rule determines what Oracle now calls expectedness. Expectedness. They created a new word for us. Fortunately, it's not an acronym. Interval rules. All intervals are considered enabled Oh, it's the target of an interval rule. So basically that means when you first set up your, uh, your DCI book, before you enter any data or create any rules, 
it acts like a regular non-select study book. Everything is expected. All the visits are going to be there. All the forms are going to be there. Then interval rule is going to be specified for a specific DCI. So you pick up a DCI, like we picked up demography, and we're going to apply that to all visits where that DCI is entered. Now, in our case, demography was only one place, but it could have been something done on, like we had the multiple hematology interim visits. We define it for a specific interim visit, and we respond in a specific form that's over multiple visits. That rule is going to specify all the visits with a DCI. It's going to be apply over all the rule, all the visits with the DCI is entered. Then, depending on the DCI, you, the trigger will determine if an interval is enabled or not. If it's enabled, it will appear. The visits will appear. If it's not enabled, it will not appear. You can trigger an interval when any data is entered into the DCI. You can also trigger an interval when there is a specific response to a question. Uh, that question has to be related to a DVG. <coughs> <clears throat> but there are ways to uh, <clears throat> using derivations to trigger it or to have a trigger of an actual value, like less than 20, you don't want it to uh, do anything. And trigger actions can be enabling one or more named intervals, enable the next interval, or bypass to a specified target interval. When you bypass, you basically disable anything between where you are and where you're going. Enabling one or more target intervals, you're enabling multiple times. Enable next interval, the next cycle, the next highest set of uh, visit numbers. So we look at the rules. Before we define any book rules, all DCIs and all CPEs and all intervals will appear in the RDC CRAM. So before we enter any define any rules, all the rules we set up in our, our sample study are there. Then we're going to debate a rule. We're going to say, hey, let's look at the demography form. Rule, enable the completion and, log, completion and log interval if any date is entered on demography. So the trigger, and again, this is going to be pressing the uh, DCI rules button. The trigger says, for demography DCI, if there's any data, and there's a selection screen here, an LOV here, then we're going to enable the completion and log DCIs. Again, there's a selection screen here, and you have a multi-select, and it separates by comments. And this is basically just a description, which is free field. Now, when we look at it, before demography is entered, we still see all the – well, no, we see all the treatment visits. We don't see the logs and – completion intervals or completion visits because now these two intervals are a target of a rule. They're the target of this rule. So they don't appear now unless that trigger actually executes. When we enter demography data, those two new intervals will appear. But again, these treatment visits still exist because they're not yet the target of a rule for an interval. So let's create one. Let's say that we want to have the enroll enable the A cycle one interval or the B cycle one interval, depending on whether the arm assigned is going to be A or B. So it's on the enrollment, the enrolled DCI, the enrollment DCM, a specific question and a specific value of a response to that question will either enable the arm A cycle one interval or the arm B cycle one interval. And now when we do that, we see we don't have arm one and arm, arm A, A, arm A cycle one or arm B cycle one. We only have the other interim visits, again, because they're not yet part of a target. If we enroll in arm A, the arm A visits, arm A cycle one appear. If we enroll in arm B, the arm B cycle one visit will appear. We have another rule saying that at the last interim visit for a cycle, if the response to the next cycle, yes, no, is no, bypass the completion. If the response is yes, then enable the next sequential interval. Well, again, we have the DCI called interim hematology. That's the DCM. 
That's the question name, and that's the value, yes or no. And if it's no, we're going to bypass to the completion. If it's yes, we're going to enable cycle one interim uh, and also the interim cycle two and the interim cycle three. Because we have next interval, I'm sorry, these are the ones, these are actually maintained by the system. But the next interval says, okay, if we're on cycle one, enable cycle two. If we're in cycle two, enable cycle three. Next interval. Now when we look at what actually happens, we see again, and this is what we wanted, only screening. Because now, we had rules for cycle B at least, we're going to have every cycle except, every interval rather, except screening being enabled by some DCI interval rule. So everything disappears. And when we add demography, we add the end of study log intervals. When we enroll in cycle A, we add the interim rule for the uh, cycle one treatment and interim visits for cycle A. And of course, if you enroll in cycle B, it, was the same, it would be the same. If we answer the question yes, the HEMA interim, it's going to enable cycle two. If we say no, it's going to bypass to end of study and completion and the log information. Nothing else is going to be expected. And if we say yes to cycle two, it enables cycle three and so forth. At cycle one, treatment two, dose is not given. Again, the only uh, we just want the uh, current existing visit being able. We don't want to go any further, and that's going to be the same particular thing. Same same rule takes care of that. Okay. Last rule I want to talk about. Around schedule, I think. Only DCIs which contain one or more questions associated with DVG can have DCI rules. Within an interval, you can define a rule to enable specific DCIs in that visit or, of course, all visits which contain that DCI. The DCIs have to contain a DCM with a question associated with a DVG, an internal DVG, uh, because you have to know what the possible choices are. And here we have a, a rule, DCI rule, which says, for the dose hematology DCI, hematology question group, give dose yes, no, if the value is yes, we're going to enable the diffusion DCI within that clinical planned event. So at a treatment visit, if the dose given yes, no is yes, then the infusion form must be made expected in that visit. And in fact, that's what happens. Before the give dose yes, no question is answered, the infusion form is labeled, but the dash indicates it's not expected. You give dose yes, no is completed, then it will, and specified as yes, it will be now expected in that visit. Okay, uh, I guess I'll write up some questions and answers, and I'm going to go to another mode, I believe. Let me just hop in there. This is Eugene Stefanoff again. Um, so it looks like we have a good number of questions, and we'll try to answer as many as we can within the next 15 minutes. Uh, we'll keep your names anonymous, and... Uh, if you guys have any additional questions that haven't been answered, um, feel free to reach out to us um, after the webinar. So Steve, yeah, go ahead and... Uh... Do these things and... Okay, first question I see is... Uh, I'm looking at these ones related to... Uh, is there a demo database available for perusal for sites that are considering using considering an upgrade for 462? Uh, basically, maybe. <laughs> uh, contact us and we'll see if we can give access to our database. It might be available. What happens if the enrollment is based on randomization? Can you set up the randomization process within the system so the right, unfortunately, these things click down when somebody has another question. Is there a demo? Uh, 
so the right share will show up automatically. No, I, I'm not sure what you mean by randomization, but uh, in, in this idea, uh, I mean, it's a separate process done by some sort of IVRS system. Possibly, it might take some custom code to write, but it's very possible you could do that. You could basically populate an existing CRF. So that's another maybe question. I'm going to answer maybe a lot without being able to get feedback on exactly what you mean. Does data have to be saved completely in order to activate the other form CPEs? Yes. Data must be saved complete in order to uh, trigger the other forms. Uh, are the actions standard or can they be customized? No, they're standard. I'm going to disable the chat now. Will you be sharing the slides? Uh, they'll be available, the recording of this will be available, the slides will not be shared. Do you think flexible set of design would be beneficial? Eugene, is there some way we can shut off the chat? Yeah, you guys, um, we're going to, there's tons of questions coming People are still adding questions and it jumps to yeah, the, we'll, the we'll list. We'll give you another minute to ask your questions and then we're going to disable the chat and hopefully we can... Um, through these because every time yeah, you guys they, 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 <laughs> and then I got to find them again. So we'll give you guys another 30 seconds to okay, that's ask great. The questions. You see the confusion I'm going through? Sure, yeah, absolutely. All right, so we're going to go ahead and uh, disable it. Disable the chat. Okay. Steve, you probably can't sift through them now, right? Oh, I can't go through. Okay, them. so I'm going to go ahead and uh, ask the questions, and you can try to make out the okay, answer. Okay, that's great. Um. Okay, so let's see. Is it possible to make DCMs visible, invisible, in a CPE based on data response? On data response, possibly, again, you'd have to write a validation procedure to, or actually a derivation procedure to look at that data response and populate a derived question associated with the DVG saying yes or no. So it would be sort of a derived question took to a DVG and a derivation procedure populates it. Very possible. Will the new OC allow locking of individual pages for single subjects such as AE or SAE form? Not sure what you mean, lock a page. I mean, or, well, again, we can't have feedback, so why don't you contact me? I'm not sure exactly what you mean. You can lock pages now down to a, a part of a DCM level. Uh, so I'm not sure exactly what's being asked. Next question. Is it possible to call complex derivation e.g. derivation of score based on questions collected in the same DCI or other DCI as DCI trigger condition? Again, you'd have to create a derived variable, which is a trigger on, trigger off, and populate that variable, and then use that to trigger the, uh, the DCI of the interval. Can we have a rule trigger based on more than one question response? No. Again, you have to have a derived variable. What happens if you select two patients who have different answers for these indicator questions? What shows up in the visit dropdown? Well, there's some new things in 4.6. There's a set visit focus, and you can set, set the visit focus, which shows the expected pages for a single patient. Or if it's not there, well, that, that would be what you do. Otherwise, if you don't set a visit focus, it's going to show all the visits for all the patients. But the patients where it's not expected will have dashes in there. Once data is entered, can the arm be changed? Yes, and uh, the new visits will be expected. The old data is not deleted. It shows up as basically uh, unexpected, unplanned pages. Are the actions standard or can they be customized? They're standard. Okay. 
can you clarify the difference between a trigger condition and a trigger action? Is there a place where these are noted, identified as one or the other? Well, a trigger condition is something that when that condition is true, it causes an action. And on the screen that I, you know, that I went through in the, in the uh, part of the lab part of the thing, you can see there's basically the trigger condition, what question, what DCM, DCI, what question, what DVG value, that's on the left-hand side, that's the trigger condition, and the trigger action is what to do when that condition is, is, is met. I understand that this doesn't work with page tracking, but what happens with the page numbering? We put that in footer for PDR, but it seems like it probably shouldn't be used with flexible studies because they could have different numbers for the same RDCI for different patients. That's true. You still have page numbers, uh, but they don't have the same meaning. And again, for it would be you know missing page numbers. They'd have one to fifteen, and then up to thirty-five, depending on what this stuff is. So that's correct. Do you think that flexible study design would be beneficial for paper studies, not using RDC but just OC? It has no effect in just OC. It has no no utility at all. The DCI book might be useful uh, to set up your you know your 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 studies because it has some nice features in there, but you will not see any flexible study design, no dynamic nature in a, in a paper study at all. All right, and uh, if you answered yes to form A to continue to the next cycle and expected visits shown up, data was entered for the next cycle, and then you went back and clicked no. Okay, this is a very long question, it's a little confusing, so Thanks. I'll probably have to get back to you on okay. that one. Um, how will the dynamic setup impact edit check programming? Uh, I don't really think it should. I'm, I'm thinking about this. You, can, you can't see the smoke coming out of my head. But it really shouldn't have any effect. The edit check program is a little different for RDC. You have to worry about a few other things because it's, you, know, you get immediate feedback. But it really shouldn't affect the edit check programming at all. All right, what about the procedure if the page did not exist? Missing pages, again, uh, depending on how the procedure is set up, it may or may not fire a discrepancy or create a derivation. If you want to do that, uh, you'd have to write a derived, again, a derived variable to cause the trigger to occur. Okay, with flexible study design, will the missing and overdue DCM report still function correctly? I don't think so, but I'm not sure. All right, it looks like we got through the first set of questions before we turned off the, uh, the chat. I enabled the chat, so if you guys have some more questions, we could probably answer several more before we uh, end the session. All right. Can a trigger question, question be a repeat and a re repeating question group? No. I mean, it can be. You can have a. Um, I'm just joking. Uh, I'm not sure. I was answering another question. <laughs> uh, it can't be used in conditional branching. Can it be used in a repeating question group? I don't think so because. I've never seen a repeat number in the in the screens. All right, the next question. Does design is, work in the same way in test mode? I don't know. I can't read the one that's on there now. Something about are you aware of any air focus error in RD because conditional branding needs state page? I'm not aware of any. Is zero okay, it's moving up again. Well, a few more, few more minutes for questions, then we'll have to stop so I can actually read them. All right, so we'll give you guys another um, minute or two to uh, ask some more questions, and then we'll kind of do the same thing we just did.
30 more seconds. Let me go ahead and uh... okay. just want to comment there's a thunderstorm brewing here, and sometimes our electricity goes out, in which case we lose everything. <laughs> hopefully that doesn't happen. But we only have a few minutes, so hopefully it won't it won't flow out. <laughs> okay. Does flexible study design work the same way in test mode? I don't believe so. I, I would try it. I'm not sure. Could you please send the link to the recording of today's presentation? We will be sending uh, the presentation to all participants within the next 24 hours. Is there no way to add different page numbers per arm similar to using selections with different page numbers within Word? I don't believe so. Are you aware of any focus error in RDC because of conditional branching when you save a page? I'm not aware of any, but I don't follow the bug, so very carefully. You had indicated that the flexible study design cannot be turned on in clinical study states if at least one RDCM had been received. Is there any work around this? No, other than to re-enter all the data, which of course is not realistic for a study, for an RDC study. Do you need to validate DCI book for flexible studies? Well, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by validate. Uh, it has a, a used in many different uh, contexts. There is a function, I believe, within the enhanced DCI book called validate the book, and that will check to make sure it's consistent. Uh, you should certainly, as part of your study verification process, undergo you know a check to make sure everything's firing the way you expect it to fire. That people think validating a study, verifying the study. Uh, it's CFR Part 11 validation, of course, as well, and of course that should be validated as part of CFR Part 11 validation. Okay, and the last question is: If conditional pages were populated and entered, and previous data changed to disable them. How would they be displayed in the system? The data is still there, but basically it will no longer be expected. Uh, it's going to be the, the new, there's an N which is not planned, which will be next to the icon when that patient information showed up. So the, if you move change information, so that things that are suddenly were required before are no longer required, if you enter them, they'd be there for you to look at. You can't throw away the data but it is marked as not planned. So the site could delete the data, delete those CRFs if they wanted to and re-enter it in the right form, or just leave it there and have the sponsor fix it in the end. All right, that concludes the questions that we have time for as of right now. Um, it's about 10.56, so it's, I think it's a good uh, end point right now. Um, Steve, do you have any last minute comments or anything? No, uh, except that uh, this is an, it's actually a pretty good product. It's always been pretty good. Now it's even better with the flexible design. Uh, it gives you a lot more ability to do things, and uh, you should consider moving to 462. All right, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the webinar for today. Uh, please note again that today's webinar will be available on biofarm.com within 24 hours for you to review and share with your colleagues. Um, if we can be of any assistance to you, if you have any other questions or comments or anything like that, you guys can uh, complete the survey at the end of the webinar, or you guys can go uh, onto the website and find a phone number or fill out a contact form, whatever it may be. Feel free to do that. We'll get back to you. Um, and uh, once again, thank you so much for joining us today. We had a very, very large crowd, kind of our biggest one yet. Um, and we had tons of questions. We couldn't get through all of them, but we got through most of them. So once again, thank you so much for your time today, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day or night. Thanks so much. Thank you.